manganese 53. What we see here is a carried manganese 2 plus solution containing manganese 53. These are used for analysis with AMS, accelerator mass spectrometry. What is the plan for today? Of course, we are going to talk about nuclear data and Auger electrons as well as the potential of manganese 53 as a terrestrial radionuclide for geochronology and then we will look at its use in dating meteorites. As always, let's start with the nuclear data. Manganese 53 has a half-life of 3.7 million years. It is a electron capture only nuclide and decays into stable chromium 53 without emitting gamma lines. Accordingly, I cannot give you any better plus energies, but it has Auger electrons and X-ray lines and I'll get to that in a moment. I rarely spoken about these on the channel. It has a specific activity of 67 megabecquerels per gram. So, Auger electrons and X-rays and gamma radiation. These are the only type of ionizing radiation that a radionuclide can emit if there is not enough energy available for proton rich nuclide to do better plus decay. The cutoff here is at least 1022 kilo electron volt of energy difference between the parent and the daughter nucleus. The Q value for this decay, i.e. the maximum available energy, is just 597 kilo electron volts. It could be that the manganese 53 does electron capture into an excited state of chromium 53. That would also fit in terms of energy. The first excited state of chromium 53 is at 564 kilo electron volts, but in this state the nuclear isomer has a spin of one half with a negative parity. The manganese 53 has a spin of seven halves with also negative parity. The ground state of chromium 53 has a spin of three halves. Therefore, the ground state of chromium 53 with a spin of three halves is more favorable. The electron capture for the manganese therefore does not take place via the excited chromium, i.e. we don't have any gamma emissions from this decay. But it's still electron capture. And where is the electron captured from? Mostly from the innermost shell, the K shell. So now we have a hole that can be filled by electrons from the L shell. This transition is associated with an emission of photons. This so-called K alpha or according to the new UPAC nomenclature KL transition results in the emission of 5.415 kilo electron volts in X-ray photons. This can also happen from other energy levels of the L shell. Then we are talking about K alpha 2 transitions. The transition from the still higher M shell would then be called a K beta transition and there we would also have a higher energy difference with 5.946 kilo electron volts. However, the energy does not have to leave the atom as an X-ray photon, but it could also be transferred to other electrons which are then shot out. These are so-called Auger or Auger-Meitner electrons. So an electron makes a chi alpha transition to fill in the hole created by the electron capture and then transfers the energy to the K electron. This is then shot out of the atom with an energy between 4.591 and 5.979 kilo electron volts. The energy can also be transferred to one of the other L electrons in which case we have L Auger electrons with an energy of around half a kilo electron volt. This explains the other type of ionizing radiation emitted by a radionuclide. This can also happen with other types of decays, but for electron capture only without gamma, these are simply the only types of radiation that a nuclide can emit. Glad we've cleared that up. So what do you need manganese 53 now for? Geochronology. I've just spent the last weeks plundering the radionuclides of our geoscientists. Also, manganese 53 is a cosmogenic radionuclide. It is produced by spallation of iron. Spallations are nuclear reactions with high energy particles, often protons as part of the cosmic primary radiation. So where there's iron, you can make use of manganese 53. And where is iron found? In igneous rocks. For example, plagioclase, pyroxenes and olivine, they all contain iron. Igneous rocks are simply the result of solidified molten rock. So cold magma, if you like to call it that way. A further distinction is made between plutonic, magma that had time to slowly cool below the surface, or volcanic, i.e. magma that is shot out by eruptions and is then no longer called magma, but rather lava, and this material cools quite quickly. 
Now I should explain the other technical terms. Plagioclase are mixed crystals of the feldspar group. They also can contain iron. Pyroxene group minerals belong to the chain silicates and can sometimes contain iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. Olivine might be familiar to some people who have studied chemistry. Why it is often used in the inorganic internship for the iron lottery. Students have to make a soda extract and then prove the components of olivine. Olivine is a term for a group of different mixed crystals that can also bring the following metals into the samples for our students. Lead, calcium, iron, magnesium, manganese and nickel. So they are very suitable for this kind of experiment. By the way, the sample that I'm showing here was collected by myself when I was 10 years old on a vacation on Lanzarote. They are just lying around there. You can simply collect them. All three examples are minerals of magmatic origin with a relatively low silicate content and with a relatively high magnesium oxide and iron content. Such things are called mafic or ultra mafic depending on their characteristic. It also makes sense that they are particularly suitable for manganese dating. Where there's more iron, there's more potential for manganese 53 production. The production rate is merely 103 plus or minus 11 atoms per gram per year. However, it has to be said that the investigation of terrestrial objects such as the olivine, etc. using AMS measurement is a fairly new idea. So manganese 53 as a TCN, terrestrial cosmogenic nuclide, was only first formulated as an idea in 2006. Before that, dating with manganese 53 was already known, but only referred to extraterrestrial matters. And I'll come to that in a moment. The very good thing for dating here is there is almost no meteoric manganese 53. Meteoric is to be adequated with atmospheric. It has nothing to do with meteorites. With chlorine 36, for example, we had the problem that it can be produced both inside the rock and in the atmosphere and then can trickle down onto the surface of our sample as so-called meteoric chlorine 36. But here again, we also have a very significant isobaric problem. This means that chromium should be first chemically suppressed before the measurement. After the usual rock crushing iron extraction, the material is run through a cation exchanger where manganese 2 plus remains rather poorly and the chromium 3 plus minimally better. The manganese is then oxidized with sodium chlorate to manganese 3 plus and is then precipitated as a oxide hydroxide. Then it is baked into the dioxide and this then can be measured. Here the chromium 53 background can further be minimized in the measurement on the AMS by measuring this sample as a manganese fluoride ion. There are many current studies on this which are primarily concerned with optimizing manganese 53 measurements in the AMS. As far as I have looked through the literature, it is not yet a standard nuclide for terrestrial materials like beryllium 10 and aluminium 26. Alright, then let's go into the cosmos because manganese 53 was established much earlier there. What we have here are samples of the chondrite Niahinia, pronounced perfectly, I'm sure. As a brief introduction, chondrite is a class of meteorite that contains many small silicate spheres in some sort of mass. The three previously learned minerals, olivine, pyroxene and plagioclase, are also components of these chondrites. And what makes this chondrite so special? 500 kilograms of the original meteorite could be recovered. That's a lot. You are usually talking about a few hundred kilograms. This paper is from 1990 and the meteorite fell at around 5 pm on June 9th, 866 in Naiji Beresna in Ukraine. I'm sure I butchered it. When it fell, the meteorite broke into three large pieces. On the basis of an extremely large number of other nuclei, it was possible to draw conclusions describing that the meteorite had been traveling in outer space for at least 40.5 million years and had a radius of 45 centimeters deviated by plus or minus 5 from a perfect sphere shape before encountering the Earth's atmosphere. So the perfect sphere is the dotted line, the solid line describes the true shape before it entered the atmosphere. And, and this is the remaining part with an extremely large number of measuring points, whereby the crosses here indicate the potential spherical center of the meteorite. 
This was primarily determined on the basis of the measurement of noble gases, but it was also confirmed with manganese 53. The transition group metals were mostly nice confirmations of the measurement, as these elements in particular were not exactly homogeneously distributed among the meteorite. However, the data for manganese 53 were not collected using AMS, but via neutron activation. To do this, 0.3 to 0.8 grams of the chondrite is thrown into a mixture of nitric and hydrofluoric acid with also some perchloric acid, and the finished manganese dioxide is then irradiated in reactors such as the one used in Jülich for 30 to 40 days at a neutron flux of 5.5 times 10 to the power of 12 thermal neutrons per square centimeters per second. The results are compared with a standard such as the Cologne Manganese 53 standard, which was produced from Iron 56 via a P-alpha reaction. We no longer have it here. The irradiated sample is then converted into manganese ammonium phosphate and then baked into manganese diphosphate to measure the 534 kilo electron volt line of manganese 54. What a complicated path. First the meteorite contains iron, which is then converted to manganese 53 via spillation and is then further converted into manganese 54 in order to then measure the gamma emissions. Admittedly, we still use neutron activation today to make gamma emitting radionuclides and the measurement of manganese 53 directly is very complicated due to its nuclear data. And I think this is quite a nice framework for this whole video from the initial nuclear data up to them resulting in the former indirect measurement of manganese 53. Hopefully we will get many more papers in the future dealing with AMS measurement of terrestrial manganese 53 in igneous rocks. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.